I'd like to welcome you all. I'm Ann Aylward, and I'm Director of USDOT's Volpe Center. Welcome to today's discussion, part of our current leadership, thought leadership series on transportation in the age of artificial intelligence and predictive analytics. Today, we're delighted to have DOT's Undersecretary, Derek Kahn, and our new boss, almost, and Kyle Vogt uh, here with us today for an important conversation related to the future of our transportation system. Thank you both for making the time to join us. Kyle um, started his career just down the street at, at MIT, and, and MIT do, does a lot of brilliant things, um, probably most notably tech development. And so given your experience, Kyle, and given all the things you've, you've done in your career, um, walk us through some of the big challenges in autonomous vehicle technology development. Uh, well, thanks, Derek, and I'm, first of all, happy to be here. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, you know, the AV 3.0 is a big, big, big deal, and we're excited to, to dig through that in more detail. Um, as for the challenges, I think, uh, you know, I'll be the first to say that this is a really, really hard problem. It's uh, perhaps one of the, um, uh, I'd say, one of the first really great applied AI problems, and I think at this point it's become clear that, you know, uh, building a prototype autonomous vehicle, one where you can put some sensors on a vehicle, integrate a computer in there, and, and hook everything up so that it works, uh, and get a vehicle to maybe drive around the block without hitting something, is something that now, with, with the tools available, you know, maybe five or ten talented engineers can do in a few months. Um, but what I think is becoming more apparent now, um, and we're deep in the middle of, is the difference between a prototype um, that can drive around the block <coughs> once and not hit something, and a commercial product that um, you know people can can entrust their safety to uh, is enormous. It's it's several orders of magnitude more complex. It takes more time to design, to develop, to validate, uh, and to collect collect data on to know that it's ready. It's easy to think about um, you know a computer driving a car. It, it, its job is very simple, right? It stays between the lane markers and it doesn't hit the thing in front of it. But what you actually find is there's a whole wide range of situations and maneuvers that the vehicle needs to be capable of doing and do them at a very, very high um, reliability and, and, and low defect rate. Um, and we find that it's not just single maneuvers, but multiple maneuvers stacking up on top of each other to create these very complex and dynamic scenes. Uh, so tough problem, um, absolutely worth doing for, I'm sure, reasons we'll talk about, you know, the benefits of this technology. One of the things that, that uh, um, we do, that perhaps uniquely, is I think in order to accelerate the development of this technology and work through these problems, you know, we're engineers. These are decomposable into smaller problems, and you can solve them bit by bit and make progress. But the way we do that is we challenge ourselves by putting these vehicles in some of the toughest environments um, so we get faster feedback and exposure to these, comp these complex environments at a much higher rate, which I think will lead to a faster overall development uh, of the technology. I, I, I want to come back to, to sort of areas of research and development in a second, but, um, but a lot of folks here deal with the macro part of mm -hmm. transportation. And as everybody here knows, transportation is just one of the keys to, to a vibrant economy. And really, the sector itself is incredible. So how do AVs fit into the broader transportation system? Um, well, you know, first of all, there's the, transportation is huge. Right? 3.2 trillion miles traveled in a year. And uh, if you look at um, what AVs could do to that, we can look at the rideshare industry as, as sort of a, a proxy for what it might become. And um, you know, the rideshare companies today uh, drive less than 1% of those 3.2 trillion miles traveled. So everything you think about rideshare, it's this big trend, it's coming, and I know you, you have some experience in this industry, that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of you know, actually having an impact on, on, on transportation uh, in the US and, and the economy at large. But um, for reasons I'll talk about in a second, um, AVs have the potential to um, lower the cost of, the, of a transportation service like what you have in rideshare today to the point where a lot of people are gonna flip from owning a car and all the burden and headache that comes with that to using a shared autonomous vehicle in a rideshare network. Um, it's gonna make sense economically, it's gonna be safer, more, um, basically more accessible and, and more convenient. It's gonna give you that time back that you spend on your commute. Um, so when that happens, you know, that's gonna be a huge market opportunity and you know, this isn't a sales pitch for Cruise, but that's a really big um, opportunity. And the reason that's important is when there's a big business opportunity like that, it's gonna drive um, new degree programs at our schools, it's gonna drive online courses, it's gonna drive a whole new wave of engineers studying AI, machine learning, uh, controls, robotics, um, that are gonna enter the field because it's supported by this large op market opportunity. And then I think um, 
the more people enter the, the field, the faster we're going to see this rate of developments uh, and innovation, you know, particularly in this country. It's, it's going to be really great. So I, I think that there's this domino effect that happens because um, uh, AVs are going to come in, lower the cost of transportation so that many, many more vehicle miles traveled are going to, to be done by autonomous vehicles, which is going to open up uh, the floodgates for, for the next wave of, of, um, uh, of knowledge workers. Right now, um, a lot of vehicles are underutilized, right? So 94, 95, 96% of cars sit idle in terms of hours. Um, and, and people talk about sort of shared mobility with, with the concept of AVs, but walk us through sort of both the pros and cons here because high, higher utilization also likely means higher congestion. So if you could walk through, how will AVs change the transportation market and what does that mean for congestion? Well, I think um, to, st to start with, the, the utilization rate is interesting um, because it ties back to cost. So uh, if you have vehicles that, uh, you know, as you said, are not sitting idle 95% of the day, but in fact being utilized nearly 24-7, um, that's going to cost less per mile, uh, which is going to be a very good thing for, for accessibility of this transportation. Um, but I think it will cause more people to want to use it. And I think that's, that's a good thing if we're re reducing the friction for transportation um, and making it more accessible, but it, it could have an impact on, on congestion. I think that's something that we need to think about uh, more deeply. The... Um you mentioned earlier about research and development, and you started your career at, at MIT. So what, what areas of research and development should be done either in the application, development, or, or, or testing and deployment of, of AV technology? Where, where, as we in this room, a lot of folks are, are transportation researchers, where, where are the greatest needs right now? Well, there's a lot of good stuff happening, first of all. I mean, when you go um, to... Uh, the big robotics or machine learning conferences right now, they're just, they're bustling, they're overflowing with um, engineers who are working on problems specifically for autonomous driving. So that's really great. There's an ecosystem, it's already flourishing, there's a lot of great talent being developed and nurtured, um, and they're attacking the right problems. I think the, the things that are underexploited today are sort of what comes a little bit further out into the future. So there's a lot of focus right now on sensor processing, using the sensors that exist today, and um, sort of the first versions of, of uh, these self-driving car systems. What there isn't as much of is uh, thinking about vehicles at a fleet scale. So not just building the first self-driving car, but what happens when you have hundreds or thousands of these in a city and they're all sharing information? Can they look around corner, corners? How can they coordinate to do things like reducing congestion um, uh, or, or, or even acting as, as infrastructure for one another? So I, I always love asking people this, but paint us a picture of the future because you, you, you spend a lot of time thinking about what the future of cities, what the future of transportation looks like. So, so walk us through of when, when you, you think crews will start commercializing these systems and what does sort of the 5, 10, 20 years look like? And we're going to keep this on video and play it back at all future sort of meetings. Sure, there. a little <laughs> retrospective after yeah. the fact. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I've got to be careful what I say then. Uh, let's see. So first of all, commercialization. So there, there are an enormous number of things that still need to be done before this technology is deployed um, in the complex urban environments where we want to and deployed at significant scale. Now, um, my company is hard to work on these things. So there's, there's almost 1,000 people now in San Francisco working uh, at Cruise on this. We're, we're landing big partnerships like the one yesterday with, with Honda. Um, so all the pieces are coming together to make this happen. Um, that said, I think as I pointed out at the, be the beginning of this conversation, um, getting from that, that prototype phase to a commercial product is, is just an enormous task. Um, there's, I think it's underappreciated how good human drivers are. Um, even though most of the accidents that are caused by humans being distracted and, and doing silly things, um, the fact that humans can handle these edge cases and unusual situations that I showed here really well uh, is what sets us apart from, from these machines. And so doing that as well as humans or even better in the future takes an enormous amount of work. Um, but if we look at the rate of progress that companies like Cruise and others have been making, it's exponential uh, towards getting towards this point in which these things can be launched and deployed at scale. Um, and so that means it's, it's only a matter of time, and, and for us that target is, is close to the end of next year, um, to be able to launch these in a complex urban environment such as San Francisco without drivers. Now there's a lot of things that need to happen, but that's, that's what we're shooting for. Wow. The, um you mentioned that humans are very good at, at navigating complex situations. Can, can you just give us a, a quick sort of overview of the heuristic of how an AV car works and how that emulates the, the, the brain or the human? Sort of just give us a quick primer. 
Uh, sure. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll do self-driving cars in, in 60 seconds, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> it only took you 20 years, right? <laughs> so so the, the, the general notion, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is um, you have... Um, you know, a sensing, a, a processing system, and then actuation. This is this is true for almost any robotic system. Um, and so, the sensing today usually looks, uh, usually consists in our products and many others um, with different sensing types. In this case, lidar, uh, which uses laser to measure distances, cameras, which you know are closest to the human eyes, and, and radar, um, uh, which are really good at dealing with tough weather situations and, and measuring velocity. That sensor data goes into a computer, and the computer generally is trying to build a synthetic view of the world, like a picture, a mental model of what the world looks like. Um, and once it has that mental model, then it's trying to plan a set of maneuvers or trajectories for the vehicle to, to drive through in order to get to where you want to go. Uh, and then that trajectory is sent to the actuators in the vehicle, um, you know, which is basically a, a drive-by-wire version of, of steering wheel and, and uh, pedals, and that's what, that's what moves the car. And that whole system from sensing to processing to control uh, happens at a very fast rate, you know, 10 times per second or more. Mm -hmm. um, and it's being continually updating as the, as the vehicle moves through the scene and the objects around it change. That might have been longer than 60 seconds. But. <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, as you think about sensors, and sensors are sort of the future, and LIDAR's fairly new technologies and, and control units, um, this is sort of future meeting the past. And, and it's interesting because Cruz is essentially a startup, I, my understanding is five or six years old, that, that's part of GM, one of the world's or the certainly the nation's oldest companies. So, so talk to us a little bit about how you maintain a startup culture. How do you maintain sort of the innovation, the creativity, nimbleness, um, at the same time of having this very established company that has decades, literally decades of, of experience of operating? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, uh, Derek. And I think the, the reality of the situation is these types of deals where a large company acquires a small company, um, usually what happens is whatever got that company to, to innovate and, and be, uh, build really interesting stuff in the beginning somehow disappears when it's, mm -hmm. when it's acquired. And I'd say like 90% of those kinds of deals don't really fulfill their intended objection or ob objective. And um, the thing that I believe is making it work for Cruise is one, a very strong uh, conviction and shared vision of the future. For, for what we want to build together. So the leadership at GM, Dan Ammon and, and, and Barry Barra um, are visionary mm -hmm. and they've come out with their um, vision of zero crashes, zero emissions, zero congestion. And everything we're doing um, at Cruz building autonomous vehicles is in line with that. So very strong uh, leadership support for this is, is a key factor. And the other is um, the right level of independence. So Cruz is geographically located in San Francisco. Um, GM is headquartered in Detroit. That's far enough that it's hard for them to come, you know, knock on the door every time they have a question. Um, and but it, it does enable the right amount of, of collaboration and communication. Um, and so there are things that a, a company like GM has like vast institutional knowledge on that we don't want to overlook when it comes to, um, I'd say, the existing paradigm of automotive safety, functional safety, and validation. Um, we don't want to we don't want to lose um, all that all that institutional knowledge and access to brilliant people who know how to do those things. Um, that said, there are, there are pieces of this problem, solving the things that I showed in the video, that require very fast iteration and um, sort of a way of solving problems when there's still a large amount of ambiguity and, uh, in the exact requirements. And that's what we do really well. So, so the ultimate challenge has been to maintain that independence so that we can each do what we're uniquely good at. And I think by putting those two things together, you get something that's far greater than uh, either company could do by itself. I, uh, I, I'm, it resonated with me, and I'm sure a lot of folks in the room, about the right level of distance, because mm -hmm. DOT headquarters in D.C., Wolby's in Boston, <laughs> so when you said the right level of distance, everybody in the room basically yeah, nodded it, huh? your head, so way to speak to the audience. Okay, very good, very good. Um, you, you, you mentioned that um, AVs are perhaps the best a application of, of AI. And, and help us unpack that a little bit. What, you, know, you, you talked about sensing... Um, but why is that? Why is today unique? And what, what in the, sort of the arc of artificial intelligence and, and where we are today ma makes this time special? Well, um, AI is, is, a, is a fascinating engineering subject. Engineers love to work on AI problems um, because the, um, there's some promising re results and a lot of innovation happening in the field right now. But what's happening with AV is because there's this huge market opportunity because there's a huge potential social impact on improving safety. Um, in our case, we're using electric vehicles, so, so it can uh, be a cleaner form of transportation. Um, all of those things are um, 
motivating more people to enter the space and work on these problems. And what I said, or what I think I meant was this is one of the most impactful applied AI problems mm -hmm. you can do today. So people, when they're, they're going, coming out of these um, you know, graduate programs and, and getting these degrees in this industry, um, now have a place to go where they can take that, that academic curiosity and fascination with the, with the problem itself and that, that pure uh, passion for, for solving tough problems and apply it to a problem that has perhaps one of the largest impacts of any engineering work being done today. Uh, and that's a powerful combination. And this only happens maybe once every 10 years or, or several decades where you have this convergence of high um, social impact, um, deep, deep, deeply challenging technology problems, um, and big market opportunity. And when those three, three things come together, um, it, it creates something really special. I, I see self-driving cars today as, as sort of the Apollo program of this generation in terms of the... Um, the investment into the technology, and I think the peripheral benefits we're going to see from all this focus on, on AI, whether it's the algorithms themselves or the hardware and compute systems that these algorithms run on, everything has just, just been put into hyperdrive and is being accelerated by the interest in this space. One last question. You mentioned ecosystem, and, and I think this concept of um, this is like the Apollo, this generation is a, is a great analogy that that if you look at the Apollo, it was not just the Apollo, but it was Apollo versus Sputnik. Mm -hmm. And so could you give us a sense of your, your view of the landscape, the ecosystem? You know, what are some of the emerging technologies? What are some of the growth unlocks we're going to see in this space? And, and if, if you have a point of view, um, a little bit about the international scene. So tell us about the whole world around AVs. You can have like 90 seconds this yeah. time. So. Um, well, that's interesting. So I... Um, the, the thing that surprises people a little bit about autonomous vehicles is that it is an ecosystem or a, a system of systems um, to actually make a, a product here because it's not just the um, software that runs on the car um, or the software that directs a large fleet of cars where to go and where to pick up passengers. Um, there's, there's also an, an enormous amount of simulation and backend infrastructure and mapping infrastructure that needs to exist. Um, and, and real-time communication systems for either keeping those maps up to date or perhaps assisting vehicles that get stuck. And when you put all the pieces together um, that are required to, to, to do what we're trying to do, which is to launch a uh, fleet of rideshare vehicles in a city at significant scale, it's, it's uncomfortable for me to say this, but it's like 20 startups in one. Mm -hmm. And I say it's uncomfortable because as an entrepreneur, I want to solve the smallest piece of, of, of the, the puzzle that I can in order to get the, yeah. the maximum result. And to know that we have to basically build 20 different startups within a startup uh, is enormously um, intimidating and, and, and really just you know, goes to show why it takes so many people and so much capital to do this. So in the ecosystem, what I see happening is a bunch of companies are popping up, both domestically, internationally, that each one of them are, are sort of trying to solve one piece of that puzzle and do it really well. Um, and the hope is that maybe over time, there will be enough um, uh, maybe AV software producers uh, contributing to that ecosystem and pulling from that ecosystem that will have many other companies pop up in, in sort of ancillary um, uh, industries or, or fulfilling different pieces of that overall puzzle. And how about internationally? Uh, Which countries are, are most ahead in AV sort of, yeah, as you look at sort of countries, any, any point of view there? Uh, so, so it's really hard to measure one AV compared to another today. There's no universally agreed upon measurement, and I think that's because it's really hard to do. Um, but I would say the uh, United States is doing really well. I'd say some of the most, most innovative um, players are here, and I think that's, that's um, uh, no surprise. Like Things like the DARPA Grand Challenge and Urban Challenge really took place in the United States and I think kick-started uh, the industry that exists today. Um, and uh, yeah, as for deploying technology internationally, I think my view is I want to make this work really, really well in the first place it's deployed and really just, just prove to ourselves and to our customers and really to the industry that this, this, is, this technology works and it's ready and it is actually achieving um, the impact, the positive impact we hope it will all achieve. And then from that point forward, move forward. And um, you know, so when I think about really chaotic driving environments, like you know, if you've ever been on the roads of India or places in China or other things. I thought you meant San Francisco, actually. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I thought you meant Boston. Yeah, or Boston. <laughs> it's a piece of cake compared to <laughs> India and other places. Um, we'll get there, but I think like just in the United States alone, that 3.2 trillion miles is a lot of impact we can have just, just domestically. And so I think that's a good place to start, um, you, know, you know, and with people like you helping uh, to pave the way for that, I think there's a lot we can do just in the United States to begin with.